Do you ever think about sound? How is it that you're able to hear me right now? It's pretty crazy when you think about it. For decades now, we've had the ability to listen to whatever we want, whenever we want, and it keeps getting easier. Now we just go online, ask for music, sound effects, whatever, and have almost immediate access to it in high fidelity right now. But how did we figure any of this out? Well, that's what this show is all about. I'm Alec, and this is Technology Connections. To answer our questions, we have to go back. Way back. Like, 1870s back. We'll start right at the beginning with the first device to reproduce sound. Thomas Edison's phonograph. Wait, I, th I thought we decided that wasn't first. As I was saying, uh, we'll start out with the first device to reproduce sound. Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Back in 1876, Bell figured out a way to capture sound, transform it into an electrical signal, and then change it back into sound at the other end of a wire. How did he do this? Well, first, he had to understand what sound is. Side note, there are many people who can lay claim to inventing the telephone. For instance, Elisha Gray patented the telephone using a water microphone, and Philip Rice had a so-called make-or-break telephone. We'll be focusing on Alexander Graham Bell since he's most commonly attributed as the inventor of the telephone, as he was the first to patent it. Sound is simply the result of moving air. You see, air is a compressible fluid, and that means that when things move, they push some of the air next to them away in the direction they moved. And that's how fans work. Because of the wing-like shape of a fan's blades, as they spin, it pushes the air in front of them away from the fan, and it moves so much air that it makes a strong breeze. But, you say, fans aren't that loud. You can't feel a breeze from a loud noise, so if sound is just moving air, wouldn't a fan be extraordinarily loud? Well, that's a good question. While sound is caused by moving air, it's how the air moves that causes sound. See, a fan will create a constant current of air moving in one direction, and that's not going to make much sound. No, the key to sound is oscillation. Objects that create sound move back and forth very rapidly. This is a process called oscillation, or more commonly, vibration. As an example, let's take a look at this piano. The strings inside of it are under tension, which means they'll vibrate if struck. When the hammer strikes these strings, they start to vibrate. As they move in one direction, they push a little bit of the air next to them away. Then as they move in the other direction, they pull some of the air next to them back. This happens very quickly, much faster than we can see. But it's the pushing and pulling of air that causes sound. See, our ears are able to detect when air is being pushed and pulled, because along with that action comes a subtle change in air pressure. Way down inside your ear is your eardrum. It's a thin membrane that separates the inside of your head from the air around it. If there's a pressure difference between the air inside your head and the air outside, it's going to cause your eardrum to move. For example, if the air pressure around your head gets higher, it's going to cause your eardrums to cave inward because there's more pressure being exerted on them from the outside than inside. Conversely, if the air pressure were to decrease, your eardrums will start to bulge outward, and that's because there's a lot of pressure on the inside of your head pushing them out. This is what causes your ears to pop when you go up in an airplane. As you get higher and higher, there's less air around your head because the atmosphere is thinner, so that causes your eardrums to bulge out. Your ears pop when there's a sudden change in the pressure between them, when the pressure is equalized. That causes the clicking sound and then the sudden relief in pressure. The key to sound is that, as is the case with the piano, the rapidly vibrating piano strings cause a rapid fluctuation in air pressure, and when this makes it to your ear, it causes your eardrum to move in and out very rapidly. In other words, the vibration of the piano strings is transmitted through the air to your eardrum. Once it's there, the vibration in your eardrum causes the bones in your inner ear to move, which makes its way to your cochlea, and your brain then interprets the stimulation as sound. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so how the heck did Bell figure out the phone? Well, think about your ear a little more. Remember, our ears are able to collect and transform sound waves, what we usually call the rapid fluctuation of air pressure, and the stimulation in the brain, and it does so mechanically. Remember how it detects the pressure difference between the inside and the outside of your head. So if you understand how the ear can capture sound, then it stands to reason that we should be able to do it artificially. And that's what Bell did. And he actually wasn't the first one to do it. Let me introduce you to Edouard Leon Scott de Martinville. He created a device back in 1857 called the phonograph, and the phonograph was used to study the nature of sound. Martinville's device had a diaphragm at the base of a sound collecting horn. This diaphragm, just like our eardrums, would vibrate as a result of ambient sound. But instead of the diaphragm being attached to the bones of the inner ear, Martinville's diaphragm was attached to a needle. 
What he did was he took this needle and had it drag over the surface of a cylinder coated in lamp black. This lamp black would be scratched off by the needle and it would create a line. Now because the diaphragm vibrated because of ambient sound, that would cause the needle to move along with it. So as it scratched off the line, it made a wobble in the line. Martinville used the shape of this wobble to study the nature of sound. The phonograph didn't reproduce sound though, it was just a study tool. By studying the different shapes of the wobbles it made, Martinville was able to figure out how the different characteristics of sound affected them. So what did Bell do? Well, he took the operating principle of the phonograph and applied it in a different way. His idea was to use the vibrating diaphragm to alter an electric current. Scientists had been messing around with electromagnetism for a long time before Bell cranked out the phone. One of the things we learned is that if you pass an electric current through a coiled wire, it creates a strong magnetic field. Coils of wire wrapped around in a cylindrical shape are called solenoids. If you put something magnetic, like an iron slug, inside of a solenoid, then a current moving through it will cause the slug to move. This is a somewhat modern solenoid used in various types of machines. It's made of plastic and it's got a bunch of wire wrapped around a core. Now it's got a hollow center so that this iron slug can move up and down inside of it. If you pass a current through that coiled wire, the slug will move up into the solenoid, like this. See that? Now imagine if you kept turning the current on and off. If you did that, you could control how the solenoid moved. You could control its movement up or down based on whether or not you had current going through. Something like this. An entire industry popped up using this discovery, the telegraph industry. Operators would turn the current on and off through a wire, and by using Morse code, they could use the series of dashes and dots to communicate over long distances. When operators use a telegraph, they are modulating the current going through the telegraph based on Morse code. Modulate can mean a bunch of different things depending on context, but we're using one simple definition, to adjust or regulate the degree of. When operators were using the telegraph on the transmitting side, they were modulating the signal because they were adjusting how they sent signal through the wire. Then the telegraph operators on the receiving end understood that modulation, which was Morse code, and could decode a message. Just like you can modulate the movement of the telegraph by turning the current on and off, sound modulates the movement of a diaphragm by exerting force on its surface. But what would happen if you reversed the process? If a diaphragm was moving on its own, would that create sound? And if so, could you potentially send sound over a wire? That's what Bell set out to try. For his telephone, he already knew how to collect sound waves artificially, as it had been done before with a phonograph. And he also knew how you could make something move with an electric current, as is the case with the solenoid. How could he put these two ideas together to create a device where you could talk on one side and be heard on another side over a wire? Well, the key was to figure out how to duplicate the movement of the diaphragm in the sound collecting device into another diaphragm. How did he do this? Well, he used his knowledge of electromagnetism and a little ingenuity to figure it out. Remember how you could modulate the movement of the solenoid by turning the current on and off? Well, what would happen if instead of just turning it on and off, you let, say, half the current through? Well, the solenoid would kind of stick up halfway. If you turned the current up, it would start to rise, and if you turned the current down, it would start to fall. So if you could control the amount of current going through the solenoid, you could control how the solenoid moves. Enter the microphone. On the speaking end of Bell's telephone was the microphone. This was a diaphragm just like your eardrum or Martinville's phonograph, but instead of being connected to the bones of your inner ear or a needle, it was connected to a variable resistor, a device which restricts the amount of current going through it. As the diaphragm moved due to ambient sound, it caused a slight change in the resistance of that variable resistor. Now if you pass a current through it and then to a solenoid, that means that for every change in resistance of the circuit, the solenoid will move a little bit. Most importantly, it would move in the exact same pattern as the diaphragm and the microphone did because the current going through it was being modulated by the position of the microphone's diaphragm. So if you attached a second diaphragm to the solenoid, you would now have a diaphragm on one side in the microphone that would move as a result of ambient sound. And on the other end of a wire, you'd have a second diaphragm that would move in the exact same fashion as the first. Now it didn't move much, but it was enough to be able to hear and understand the words being spoken into the telephone on the other side of the wire. This phone here, while definitely an antique, was made many decades after Graham Bell's invention, but it's operationally identical aside from the improvements in the base, such as the ringer and dial. In the handset, 
The mouthpiece and the earpiece have been integrated into the handset. Now, if I unscrew these covers, we can take a look at the actual microphone and the sound reproducing diaphragm, which today we'd call a speaker. Here's the microphone. It's flat and disc shaped, and it has a membrane in the middle that's separating two halves. In between these two halves are a bunch of carbon beads. Now, these beads are very fine, almost like sand, and they let a bit of the current passing through it because about half of them are touching the two halves at any given time. When sound pressure is exerted on the microphone, it squeezes the two halves together, and that makes more of the beads touch, and then this will let more current through. And then as it returns to its resting position, less of the beads touch, and less current is let through. You can look on the back of the microphone, there's these two discs here. These represent each side of the microphone, so you pass a current from one side to the other. And on the inside of the handset, there are two paddles where the microphone rests, and these are what connect up to the microphone. Now up here is the earpiece, which contains the speaker. The speaker is constructed very similarly to the microphone. Here they are next to each other. They're both flat discs, and that's because they both contain a membrane. Now remember, the microphone has a membrane that separates two halves, and it's filled with carbon beads. This also has a membrane in it, but instead of being filled with carbon beads, this membrane has a coil of wire attached to it, and it's sitting next to a magnet. Just like in the solenoid over here, when electricity flows through that coil of wire, it's going to cause it to move closer to the magnet. And it's attached to that diaphragm, so the diaphragm will also move closer to the magnet. You can actually hear this happen when you pick up a phone. If you pick up an old phone like this, you'll hear it click. And that click that you hear from the earpiece is because the diaphragm has now suddenly moved towards the magnet. If the strength of the current going through the speaker starts to waver, then the strength at which the magnet is pulling on the diaphragm will waver as well. So that means that the diaphragm is going to move a little bit. So on the other end of the telephone, you have the microphone, which picks up the current going through it and alters the strength of that current based on the sound waves hitting it. Then on the other telephone, you have another membrane that alters the way it moves based on the strength of the current. So hook one phone up to another, send a current through the microphone, and now you'll have a current that has a strength that varies depending on the sound hitting the microphone. Then pass that current through a speaker on the other end of a wire, and you'll have a diaphragm that moves based on the strength of the current. You're modulating the strength of the current on the speaking end with your voice. On the other end, that modulation causes the diaphragm to move exactly like it did in the microphone of the other phone. So now you can send sound over a wire from one place to another. A simple but powerful concept. The telephone set the stage for many of the future advances in sound reproduction. But while it was a revolutionary concept, it was limited by the fact that it used fleeting electrical signals. It could move sound from one place to another in real time, but it couldn't record them to be played back later. Thanks for joining me on Technology Connections. Next week, we'll take a look at the device that cracked the code of recording, the Edison phonograph.